Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 305. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Matthew Polly, who I think we can safely call the world's foremost expert on Bruce Lee. If you're new to the show, you might want to check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And you might want to hit whistlekick.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can check out all of our great products. You can see the other projects that we work on and really get a sense for who we are as a company and all the things that we're doing to lift up the traditional martial arts community. And that's you. By definition, that's you because you're listening to this show. And I thank you for doing so. Today's episode's a little different. Here I am having a conversation with Mr. Matthew Polly, a martial artist in his own right, a passionate martial artist. But he's also an author, and he recently released a book on Bruce Lee. Now, I know what you're probably saying. Yeah, Bruce Lee, there are a ton of books out there. I've read stuff. There are biographies. There are, there are movies. There's a bunch of it. Well, this is not your standard book. This is the most researched, most well-documented biography of Bruce Lee that's ever been put out. I've seen it. I've read through it. I'll confess, I haven't read the whole thing, because it is a huge it is an amazingly well-written book, well-researched book. And so here we are, Mr. Polly and I, talking about his life, his martial arts story, his path, and how Bruce Lee fits into it, and why he became the person to write this book. Check it out. Mr. Polly, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks for having me on. It's an honor to be here. Hey, it's an honor to have you here. We are... We're not here primarily to talk about you. And, and I say <laughs> oh, that no. because this is a, this is not typically what we do. You know, um, listeners, Mr. Polly is an author who recently released, right? The, the book's out. I, I, I didn't get a pre-release copy or something. No, no, the book's out. It came okay. out uh, June 5th. Okay. Uh, it's out everywhere, Amazon. You can get a copy anywhere you want. Okay. All right. So I haven't even told them what the book is. Yet I might I might have in the intro. I don't know. We'll see how this goes. Cause I always record the intro later. But we're here to talk about Bruce Lee, the book you've written on Bruce Lee, and almost secondarily, Bruce Lee's impact on on your life and your training. Yeah, you know Bruce Lee. The, the I, I think I'm guessing you would agree. We we've talked about it on the show a number of times. Despite being dead for a very long time. He is still mm -hmm. the most influential martial artist on earth. Yes, that's the remarkable thing. He died 45 years ago this summer, uh, July 20, 1973, and yet uh, he remains the patron saint of the martial arts. Um, anyone who comes up ends up being referenced and compared to him. And so uh, I wanted to, as a martial artist and also an author, uh, dig into his life and find out who he was as a man, because uh, we've all heard the myth. Mm. How much were you able to separate those two? Well, it's not easy. Yeah. Um, what, you know, what's interesting about Bruce is uh, he's the only major celebrity to die before he becomes famous. Enter the Dragon was released a month after his death, and so all of his uh, tremendous fame was posthumous. And as a result, uh, fans didn't have anything to work with other than his movies. He didn't have, you know, he wasn't on the Johnny Carson show. There weren't tons of TV interviews or profiles that you could go back to. And so the martial arts magazine sort of ran with Bruce Lee, the character from Enter the Dragon, and his other three Golden Harvest movies. And so he became the character he played as opposed to the man he was behind the scenes. Uh, and that resulted in um, sort of the image we have of him as this ascetic Shaolin monk who, if you dishonor his family, will take you out. Um, when, you know, he was something quite different, as you would expect, if you think about it for a second. Now, obviously... You wrote an entire book on the subject, so I, I can't expect that you're going to be able to tell us everything, not only in this, this short time that we're going to speak today, but in a couple sentences. But what are the primary differences between the perception of Bruce Lee and the reality of Bruce Lee? 
I think one of the biggest impacts I had when researching this book, which uh, took seven years and I spent six months in Hong Kong and time in LA and Seattle and talked to over 100 people, but probably the biggest impact I had was I spent two weeks in the Hong Kong Film Library just watching the movies he made as a child actor. And what struck me was People don't think about him as an actor first. They think about him as a martial artist first. But his father was an actor. Bruce Lee showed up on film when he was two months old. From the age of six to 18, he made nearly 20 Cantonese movies. None of them were kung fu flicks. He mostly, he was like the Macaulay Culkin of Hong Kong. He played uh, orphans in comedies and melodramas, and he played refined gentlemen. And so he had an entire acting career before he took up the martial arts when he was 16 under Ip Man. And his life really, uh, as an adult, was combining those two passions into one and trying to become the world's first martial arts movie star megastar. And that's who Bruce Lee was at the end, and that's how we know him. You know, I've read things where people go, well, Bruce Lee only made four films. And I'm like, well, actually, he made 25 films. Um, No one watches the early ones. Uh, And so when you see the whole arc of uh, of his work as an actor, you get a sense of, you know, Bruce Lee the actor first, who becomes Bruce Lee the martial arts master. Quite often we're talking on this show, to martial artists who have become actors. Maybe I shouldn't mm. say often, but we, we've had in... I mentioned to you before we started rolling that, you know, I, I've had other interviews today. One of them was with someone who... The episode will come out later, and we don't we never drop names ahead mm. of time, but someone who is on a martial arts TV show. Um, it's a small body to work with, so folks can mm-hmm. probably guess what the show is. Yep. <laughs> but a lot of those conversations center around how martial arts impacts their acting. I suspect that the more appropriate question here would be the opposite, how acting impacted his martial arts. That's a great question, one I've never been asked before. Uh, in Enter the Dragon, he has this great line where he, at the very early part of the movie, he's teaching the youngster, uh, having him do the sidekick, and he says you need to attack with emotional content. And that's something he drew from acting. You're supposed to put emotional content into everything you do in order to get the emotional response from the audience. And so I always thought that that was an interesting sort of actorly turn that he had invested into the martial arts, that you should put anger or fear or rage or uh, aggression into your martial arts, that there's an emotional connection to the movements. Um, And that's something as a lifelong martial artist I've never heard anybody else say. And I think that was very much from his acting background. Yeah. In fact, not only is it not something I've heard anyone say other than him, I've heard the exact opposite from any instructor that I've ever had who has spoken on the subject. They have spoken against including emotion in what you do. Right. Right. Which is interesting, right? I have the same thing. You're supposed to be like the Zen monk. You know, you're detached. You're not supposed to get upset because... You know, anger leads you to, um, you know, your adrenaline rushes and then you crash afterwards. Um, but Bruce had this idea that you're supposed to invest um, your a punch with emotion. Um, and and I, it's a fascinating sort of take on it. I'm not sure it's right, but it's something that I think as an actor on film, what he was able to do that most martial artists who become actors do is that he already knew how to invest um uh, a fight scene with emotion. And I think the hardest thing for martial artists, because they've been trained not to ever show a reaction and uh, not to show pain is it's very hard for them to sell a move, right? Um, Bob wall talked about this, that Bruce would try to teach them when you're in the ring and you get hit, you're not supposed to show any reaction because then your opponent can't read you. But when you're on screen, someone's faking the punch. They're not actually hitting you, and you have to convince them, the audience, that they did. So you have to have this big, ah, reaction to it. Uh, and so it's the exact opposite of the way you're trained to be a fighter, the way you're, what you're supposed to do as a martial arts performer. And I think that limits a lot of martial artists who start in martial arts and then try to make it on screen, is that they come off as kind of wooden, um, because what works in the ring doesn't work on film. 
Hmm. Interesting. I, I never thought of it that way, but it makes complete sense. You said you spent seven years working on this book. Did I, I get that right? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> Fortunately, seven you years, get that right. <laughs> seven years working on a book in a, um, I don't know that we can call it a crowded subject, niche, mm. but certainly you're not the first person to write about Bruce Lee. Yeah. So I suspect that this was a project of more than, than financial goals. That Bruce Lee must have represented something to you prior to you jumping in and working on this book. Yeah, I'm I'm one of the sort of archetypal uh, Bruce Lee fans. There's sort of millions of us who have a very similar origin story. Um, I was a kind of skinny, bullied 12-year-old kid when I first saw Enter the Dragon. I'd never seen a martial arts movie before, a kung fu movie. I had no idea who Bruce Lee was. But in that those two hours of him sort of kicking and hacking and smashing his way across the screen, he became my childhood hero. And so I was one of those kids who wanted to be like Bruce Lee, and that's what got me into the martial arts. And I went on and studied East Asian studies and religion to sort of follow some of his philosophical path, and then dropped out of college for two years and went to the Shaolin Temple in China, which is where Kung Fu supposedly originated, and studied with the monks. And I wrote my first book about that, and that sort of launched my career as a martial arts author. Uh, and then the second book was about mixed martial arts. I studied with Randy Couture and some of the mixed martial arts greats for my second book, Tapped Out. And then for my third book, my wife said to me, you need to pick a project where you don't get punched in the face. <laughs> so um, that's why I decided, you know, I wanted to do something that would just require research and not, not doing uh, fighting in the ring. Uh, and Bruce Lee was the perfect person because A, he was my childhood hero, but B, despite the fact that there are literally dozens and dozens of books written about him, no one's ever done a proper authoritative biography. Uh, the last one that was written was 20 years ago, 25 almost, and uh, it didn't have any footnotes or endnotes, and it was poorly researched, and so I was kind of insulted on Bruce's behalf that no one thought... You know, Steve McQueen has half a dozen decent biographies. Uh, no one thought the uh, Asian Kung Fu guy deserved one. And so I set out to correct that wrong and in the process sort of pay back what I feel my debt is to Bruce for changing my life for the better. Mm. Now, I'm not a biographer. You know, here on the show, we're telling stories. <clears throat> we're bringing the stories of individuals and, and I guess in a sense, the martial arts overall to listeners. But I've never felt a personal duty to bring anyone's story to light. And it, mm. that's almost what I'm hearing from you. You felt this sense of responsibility because it hadn't been done to properly present Bruce Lee accurately. Is that, yeah. is that accurate? Does that yeah. make it harder or easier to go into a project like this? Um, it makes it, well, it, both. Uh, it makes it easier because you've got proper motivation. <laughs> um, to do something for this long, it has to, I think it has to come from a place of love. Um, you know, no one would do this for financial reasons. Um, and so this was a passion project of mine. And that's what kept me going because, you know, two or three years into it, you feel like you're running a marathon and your, your side hurts and you don't know if you can keep going. Um, and so that was important. But the hard part is worrying constantly that you're getting it right. Uh, there are people, there are things out there that are very critical of Bruce and there are things that are like, you know, over the top, over the moon about who he was. And there are a lot of stories that have collected over the years that have never been sort of properly uh, investigated. And so trying to get the true story is as close as you can get. You can never be 100%, but trying to get as close to 100% as you can, that was the challenge. And that's what sort of would keep me up at night. Did I miss something? Am I interpreting wrong? Is there a different angle that I'm that I should take? So... Um, wanting it to be as perfect as possible, uh, which is funny because Bruce Lee was a, a notorious perfectionist. <laughs> and that's one of the things that may have led to his demise is that uh, he just was a workaholic who couldn't let go. So I, I appreciated that as, it, as this project continued year after year. As you were doing research and talking to people and traveling for this, did you discover anything about Bruce that shocked you? 
No. There were a couple things that surprised me, uh, and it wasn't until I sort of thought about him as a martial artist, uh, sorry, as an actor first and a martial artist second, it's, at least chronologically, that it made sense. For example, when you think of a Shaolin monk, you don't think of a guy who has a full-length pink coat and drives a Porsche, smokes a little pot, and has a fling or two along the way. But for uh, an actor in Hollywood in the 1960s, this was sort of par for the course. Um, and so, you know, Bruce Lee, uh, as an actor, <coughs> uh, excuse me, uh, engaged in kind of the typical sort of behavior you would expect of celebrities back then. He, he was a bit of a hippie. Um, he liked nice cars, uh, good looking women. So, um, all of these things initially I was like, huh? And then I went, Oh, of course, you know, he was hanging out with Steve McQueen. This is what these guys did. Hmm. Now, have you caught any flack for this book it, it i would imagine if you're exposing the truth of something there will always be people that resist it yeah so you know that's always a concern um particularly with someone who's so uh well regarded i think bruce is interesting because people don't just like him there's a certain almost worshipful quality um because he inspired so many people to get into the martial arts and the martial arts in many ways is a, a kind of semi spiritual journey um so far so good um most most of the people see that it's coming from a place of love and uh and that i'm not you know there's no active effort to harm bruce it's just to say who he really was so they can, everyone can appreciate uh what he was going through in fact some of the criticism i've received is that a couple of people felt i was too nice to him <laughs> and uh, i wasn't expecting that but uh, apparently there were some people who were like uh no, Bruce Lee was not nearly as good a martial artist as you make him out to be. So with Bruce Lee, you get opinions on both sides of the aisle. Mm. Now, of course, when we think about Bruce Lee, the martial artist, there are certain moments in time that are, are kind of stuck and, and they're constantly discussed. And the two that I think of are the the tournament with Grandmaster Vic Moore and the fight with um, Long Jack Man. Yeah. What did you find about either of those that listeners might be interested in? Well, the Long Jack Man is uh, fascinating to me because it's the most famous challenge match in the history of Kung Fu. Um, it plays a central role in every Bruce Lee story ever told. Uh, in fact, the uh, most recent movie about him, Birth of the Dragon, centers on that. Only the difference is it's told from Wong Jack Man's perspective. Uh, I found it interesting that, uh, and both sides also don't agree. Wong Jack Man's side has very specific views, and Bruce Lee's side have very specific views, and they don't <laughs> they don't correspond. Huh, uh, funny. Uh, Surprise. So. Uh, <laughs> So the two of them essentially have been fighting this fight over what the fight actually was for 45 years. Um, and uh, so to me, it was like a mystery uh, or like, you know, police procedural. I had to solve the case. Uh, and what I found was that um, the thing that was wrong on the Lee side of the aisle was this belief uh, or that's been propagated that Bruce Lee got into the challenge match because he was teaching Kung Fu to white people. And that had offended the San Francisco Chinatown community. And they sent Wong Jack Man as an enforcer with an ultimatum that he had to fight Wong Jack Man. And if he lost, he would have to shut down his school and stop teaching white people. That's apparently totally made up. <laughs> we don't know how that uh, myth got started. It may be that, uh, when Linda, his wife, asked Bruce why this was happening, he said something to that effect, and that's what led her to believe that. But uh, apparently it didn't occur that way. What happened was he was giving a demonstration of his Wing Chun style of Kung Fu in Chinatown, San Francisco's Chinatown at the Sun Sing Theater. And while he was doing it, he was criticizing other traditional forms of martial arts. And he said something to the effect that the old tigers in Chinatown have no teeth, and 90% of what they teach is bull. Mm. <laughs> and so, so, for obvious reasons, the old masters in Chinatown were not happy about this. 
Uh, and so Wong Jack Man uh, took up what he perceived as a challenge in order to teach Bruce some manners that they didn't care he was teaching white people. They cared that he had insulted them. And then what's wrong on the uh, Wong Jack Man side is uh, he's always claimed that it was a tie or he probably won uh, when, in fact, Bruce Lee won the fight. Um, Wong Jack Man uh, apparently was overwhelmed early on and turned his back and ran. Mm. That, that There doesn't seem to be much room for uh, interpretation in an outcome like that. Um, Yes, there doesn't seem to be. Uh, uh, Wong Jack Man's claimed that he never turned around and ran, uh, and that uh, it was split up and they both struck each other and it was evenly matched. Uh, and I, I ended up interviewing uh, one of Wong Jack Man's friends who was there, who set up the fight, and he was like, no, Wong, Wong turned his back and ran, and then Bruce, he tripped over a stair and fell, and Bruce jumped on top of him, and then we had to pull Bruce off of Wong Jack Man. Sounds pretty concrete. Yep. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> Fascinating. And how about the other incident that I mentioned? It's it's one that we've talked about on the show a few times. The, uh, what was that, 1964 with Victor Moore? Tell me, Victor Moore, again, is this the Long Beach? Yes. So you're talking about um, Ed Parker's 1964 Long Beach tournament. Correct. And Bruce gave a demonstration. There wasn't um, Bruce didn't fight at this tournament. So it, it, the the not not the not that it was a fight, but the assuming that I have the dates the the year correct. Um, okay. This was this was the exchange where um, Bruce attempted to strike Victor Moore. And Victor Moore was attempting to block it. And the, and the whole premise was that Bruce was faster than anybody else. Right. And and this is the one with the really grainy video that gets passed around and, and uh, yeah. gets, it yeah, gets yeah, slowed yeah. down, you know, like three, it, you know, it's like a whopping 12 frames of footage uh -huh. that are actually relevant and people jump <laughs> up know, and down yeah. about what it actually shows. Oh, that's so funny. You know, I didn't even write about that. <laughs> you did? Oh, Okay. Well, then that one can, can remain. Um, I, I do know about the controversy and, uh, and, and the subject, but I, he, had a, he had a couple different things. Uh, uh, I think it was Castro, um, another guy who claims that he blocked one of uh, Bruce's um, punches when he did, the, uh, when he did that uh, jump across the aisle and can you block my punch before I tap you on the forehead. Um, and so that's a kind of recurrent story that's told by martial artists year after year, the time which, that they blocked Bruce Lee. Which Castro? Uh, I'm going to have to blank on his first name. Uh, he taught in San Francisco. Raul? Yeah, Raul. Okay, yep. So, yep. Um, the, the reason yeah, I, br he, I bring but up... He says that he blocked one of, uh, one of Bruce's punches as well, and, and I just, I'll do an aside and before we come back to this. One of the things I found in researching this is almost every male that I interviewed would tell me something that they were better than Bruce Lee at. So, um, uh, Mike Stone was like, oh yeah, we used to arm wrestle and I'd always beat him. <laughs> and even Roman Polanski was like, yeah, he's a great martial artist, but we went skiing and he was a terrible skier. <laughs> so I, I, my feeling was that, uh, because Bruce Lee liked to kind of be really macho and alpha male, that all the guys secretly it annoyed them and for years they've held on to one thing that they were better than bruce lee at uh, and so by the time i called they all wanted to make sure they got in and told me the the one thing that they had they had bested bruce lee at there's something incredibly surreal about the idea that roman polanski is is going to go out of his way to say he was a better downhill skier than bruce lee i mean just I th those you know those are, are, are two names and and a sport that I never would have imagined would line up in the same sentence. Yep. Bruce Lee, yep. Roman Polanski, downhill skiing. That's, yep. that is and that's where you have to understand him as an actor. I mean, he was trying to get his career ahead. He was teaching um, celebrities. Roman Polanski was one of his celebrity students. He invited him to Switzerland for like a one-week 
uh, JKD training session, and they would go out on the slopes, and Bruce went up one day. <laughs> it was a total disaster, fell down the whole time, and refused to ever ski again. And Polanski very po- delightfully mentions this in his book. <laughs> what a trip. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, re- the reason I, I bring up Victor Moore, he was a guest on episode 20. We're going way, way back for Grandmaster. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, Raul Castro, great grandmaster Raul Castro, his senior student, now senior grandmaster uh, Rick Alamany has also been on the show. So I've gotten to know some of these names Mm -hmm. indirectly. Martial arts is a small world once you get to a certain level. And and so it is. And I just want to make the point it's very well possible that these guys did block Bruce Lee's punch. I'm not saying it's not possible. I just. I, I am noting the fact that people enjoy telling. Sure, <laughs> so sure. They've, I, they've eaten off of that story for a long time. Uh, you know, I, I knew Bruce Lee. I blocked his punch. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked on this show a few times about <clears throat> the position that Bruce Lee holds, his legacy, mm-hmm. and the notion that there will never be anyone who rises to his status. Mm. Would you agree? Uh, no one has yet, and it, they've had five decades to do it. Um, I think there's there's a couple things. One, it's very hard to compete with somebody who dies young. Um, in our culture, if someone dies young at the peak of their powers, they have a special place. So the James Deans, Marilyn Monroe's, even Elvis, who was slightly over. But um, And so Bruce Lee, we never got to see him have a movie fail <laughs> or go through a messy divorce or do a comedy that was terrible when he tried to change up his career. We just saw him as this perfect, you know, these three, you know, at the time, obviously they're dated now, but perfect movies. And so he has this kind of iconic position because of that. The second thing he has is it was because of him that the martial arts exploded in the West. It had been growing in popularity through the 50s and 60s, but it was really his move, movies that launched the martial arts craze. And before him, there were maybe um, 500 studios. And after him, there were 20 million students studying martial arts. And so all of us in this industry um, owe something to Bruce Lee that can, oh well, never be repaid, but also can't be replicated because no one else will be the second person who explodes martial arts in the West. Um, so I think I think he's he's unique in that way. He's the kind of founder. He dug the well that we're all drinking the water from. Uh, and then it's you know it's interesting because he had. It's very hard to find somebody who was uh, a solid sort of child actor or solid acting background, and then became an amazing martial artist and was able to combine those two on screen. Almost everybody starts off as a great martial artist who thinks he can act and usually can't, um, or they start off as actors who go and take six months. Um, and they're pretty good, but you know you can tell the difference between that and someone who's a genuine sort of genius or master at it. And so Bruce Lee combined two things that are very hard to find in one person. Um, I think probably Jackie Chan has come the closest. He, he's a He's a genuinely amazing martial artist and a credible sort of comedic performer on screen. Um, But you just see lots and lots of great martial artists try to become uh, martial arts actors and it never, it never quite works because they, they can't, they can't put emotion into it to return to something we said earlier. They can't invest their martial arts with emotion in a way that works on screen. We've become obsessed with Ip Man or Yip Man, depending on how you choose to pronounce it, really because of our obsession with Bruce Lee. Mm. What did, I guess my, my question, and, and then I kind of want you to just tell us a bit more about Ip Man and what you may have found. Was he that good or have we <laughs> elevated him because he was Bruce Lee's first instructor? <laughs> So that's one of the great uh, stories. A friend of mine, Grady Hendricks, who, who ran the Asian Film Society, um, tells me that you know they were trying to make a bunch of Bruce Lee movies, but they couldn't get the rights from the estate, and so they decided to shift to Ip Man. Uh, 
a funny sort of side anecdote. I was in Hong Kong and I interviewed Ip Chun, who is Ip Man's son. Uh, and at the end of the interview, I was like, so what's it like that your father has become so famous? And he's like, it's great. He's more famous than Bruce Lee. <laughs> I was like, I wouldn't go that far, but, uh, <laughs> but he's definitely a big deal. I mean, Ip Man in his own lifetime was a very minor martial arts instructor. He had a very small school, Wing Chun, uh, people knew about it, but it was not nearly as big as some of the other uh, styles like Charlie Fat and Hungar in Hong Kong. And so uh, if Bruce Lee had not been his student, I don't think there I think we can say for a fact that there would never be all these Ip Man movies. Um, but they found in his story a way to tell a lot of history. So his movies have a lot about, you know, the Chinese resistance against the Japanese. And so he becomes a kind of vessel to go back and tell period piece movies. Um, his students had great admiration for him. So did Bruce Lee. He really admired Ip Man. I think his most important influence was to try to psychologically guide his students, um, they were a bunch of sort of street tough kids with bad tempers. And he was the one who introduced them, particularly Bruce, to Taoist thought, the be like water, um, my friend, which is Bruce Lee's sort of tagline, uh, comes from Ip Man. And so in that sense, he was a true master. He wasn't just um, guiding them physically, but he was also guiding them spiritually. And so that, I think, is quite remarkable. Um, I have no idea how good he was as a martial artist, but I do know from my research that uh, when Bruce Lee went back in 1964 and did the crossing hands with Ip Man, one of his students was there, and the student commented, um, one of Bruce's students was there, and, the, and commented it was the first time he'd ever seen Bruce Lee not able to dominate someone. So Ip Man was, at least in crossing hands, as good as Bruce Lee was in 1965. Mm. Let's talk a bit more about you, because, you know, it, it's become really clear that you were, I guess, the right person to write this book because of your, the, the place Bruce Lee occupied in your heart. And, you know, you, you had this, this skill, this ability to put this book together. And were it not for your passion for martial arts, you wouldn't have been that right person. This book wouldn't have been written. So let's talk more about you and your martial arts, how you started, why you started. You know, give us a bit of that. Um, I started just because I was one of those bullied kids, and I felt like the martial arts were a way to stand up for myself. Um, it's not that I got picked on that bothered me. It's that I never would fight back. I was kind of, I would just take it. Uh, and so I felt like if I became good at martial arts, I would have the courage to kind of stand up for myself. And, you know, I took, I, I was a dojo hopper. I took whatever was available. So I think I started with Taekwondo and then I did some Aikido and some Southern Kung Fu, but I didn't really get to be very good at the martial arts until I went to China and spent two years at the Shaolin Temple where there was nothing. There were no TV, <laughs> there were no movies, there were no girls. Um, all we did was Kung Fu eight hours a day. Uh, and I studied uh, Chinese. I studied all they had to offer, but I focused on uh, Chinese kickboxing, Sancho or Sanda. And I got to be pretty good at that. And I fought in a tournament and took second place. I actually fought my own Kung Fu Challenge match against a master from the north who came to the Shaolin Temple. And he said, you know, I challenge anyone here. And the monks were sitting around sort of debating who should fight him. And I was like, I'll fight him, <laughs> not thinking they would take me up on it. <clears throat> and the monks were like, yeah, let's have the foreigner fight him. Uh, because if he loses, we won't lose any face because no one thinks foreigners are any good at kung fu. And if he wins, we'll really shame this guy because no one thinks foreigners are any good at kung fu. <laughs> and so um, uh, I was sort of their mascot for a couple years. Uh, and that really set me on the, the sort of higher end of my martial arts journey. Uh, and then I got back to the States and I, I gave it up for a bit. Uh, I was working in New York and, you know, didn't have the time, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then I started writing about martial arts and getting back into it. And I spent time for my second book, learning all, a whole 
totally different styles for MMA. It was <clears throat> my first time doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu and grappling. So that was like going back to being a white belt again where, you know, the 80-pound girl in the class can wrap you up into a ball and you feel humiliated. Um, and then uh, Muay Thai and boxing and wrestling, the, the four major arts that make up mixed martial arts. And so uh, I would say as a martial artist, my focus has been on sort of sports combat and ring fighting um, and less so on the performative aspects. Mm. Nice. What was it like going from training eight hours a day to not training? I imagine that that's got to be kind of mess with your head. Yeah, it did. Um, it was one of those, <clears throat> it was hard after I left because there was nowhere else on earth you could get exactly that same environment, obviously, um, where you, there was no TV, there was no nothing, there was just Kung Fu. Uh, and so when I came back, I was a little kind of depressed that I couldn't find a similar sort of uh, obsessive out, outlet, and that's part of the reason I, I slowed down with it. Um, but then, you know, life goes on, and you realize that uh, you know martial arts are an important part of it was an important part of my life, but that it wasn't I, that writing was my tr true calling, uh, and <clears throat> martial arts was my subject as opposed to um, my art form, and so that's something I took from the Shaolin Temple, which is. I think there's something to be said. Uh, um, men are made better by being able to master a particular art form, and it doesn't really matter which one it is, <clears throat> as long as they have a kind of passion that they can focus their energy towards. Now, you talked about the first book. You talked about the second book and that your wife found it important for you to not be punched in the face for your third book. But I wonder if after seven years she still thought that that was the right outcome. Getting punched <laughs> in the face is, is fast. It's over quickly. That's right. It doesn't take um, seven years to recover. I think after uh, seven years of me not doing childcare very often, she wanted me to get punched in the face again. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, are you going to look after the kid? I'm like, I'm working on my Bruce Lee books. And she's like, I hate Bruce Lee. <laughs> um, no, I, I think, uh, I think in general, um, my the, the advice I give to other young fighters is the, the key to a, a fighter's life is knowing when to retire. Um, and so I consider myself a kind of semi-retired martial arts fighter who goes around and bangs the bags and, and works out a little bit, but uh, doesn't get in the ring anymore. And I think that's probably right. You know, I'm 47 now. Um, I, I, the worst thing you can do is, is continue past your prime particularly when it comes to something that involves uh, your brain. Mm. Tell us a little bit about that second book. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, you know, Tapped that's... Out. Yeah. Yeah, so Tapped Out was uh, my adventures in mixed martial arts. Um, it was sort of the sequel to American Shaolin. Um, and this was as mixed martial arts was becoming sort of a craze. I started it. And so I trained with uh, Henzo Gracie in New York City. I um, got to meet F Fedor Emelianenko in St. Petersburg, which was awesome, and learn a little Sambo. I went to Thailand to learn a little Muay Thai, and then I ended up in Las Vegas for six months um, training at uh, Randy Couture's gym, Extreme Couture. And it was interesting to me, coming from a traditional martial arts background, to see this new modern mixed martial arts and the way that it differs and also continues the tradition. Um, what I think it differs from is that it's focused exclusively on the sports aspect, the competitive aspect of martial arts. And so it's all about winning and the rewards you get from winning. Like, uh, you want to be a pro fighter and you want to have, you know, hot women and a fancy car and lots of ring money. <clears throat> um, and I think martial arts, traditional martial arts at their best are, is about the spiritual journey. And that's been lost with the uh, mixed martial arts and the focus on it. On the other hand, um, traditional martial arts, and this was something Bruce Lee criticized, can get too attached to the way things were done in the past and obsessed with sort of lineage 
you know, you often hear these martial artists be like, my master studied under that master who studied under that master who da 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 to the Shaolin Temple. Um, and you're like, well, why does that matter? Like, <laughs> is your martial arts any good or not? Um, and so I think the one, one great benefit mixed martial arts is given is it's allowed an environment where people can test out things and see if they genuinely work or not in a mostly safe environment, not totally, but mostly. Mm-hmm. And so that's produced a great evolution in our understanding of you know, different techniques and what's effective and what's less effective. Nice. Now, if people want to grab this book, and I hope that they do, just the pictures themselves, You had, there's some pictures in the center that I haven't seen before. I'm sure if I really, really dug, I could find them, but, you know, Great quality photos, you know, and and it's a thick book. I mean, it doubles as a weapon if you want to keep it on your nightstand. A shield. Uh, A a shield. um, You know, you could use it to flatten your door. I mean, there's just so many (laughs) non-traditional uses for this book that it needs to be on everyone's bookshelf, I think. There you go. People are interested in doing that. Where would they get it? So you can pick up Bruce Lee Alive from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any independent bookstore. Um, it's available everywhere. I was very happy that Simon & Schuster, one of the best publishers in the country, signed it on because that meant it would get as wide a distribution as possible. And it also meant a kind of um, traditional New York publishing support for Bruce Lee and martial arts. And uh, one of the reasons I think... Uh, Martial arts often isn't held in high regard is because uh, a lot of sort of poor quality products are put out there. And we wanted to make this the kind of biography that you would see about, you know, John Wayne or, you know, Abraham Lincoln. Like uh, any, any major figure would have be treated with this kind of level of respect, which I think Bruce Lee deserves for his cultural impact. And so it's got great photos. It's a big, thick biography. It's got a hundred pages of notes. So if you don't agree with something, you can see where I got the reference from. Uh, And there's an index, you know, all the things that you expect of a high quality product. Right on. What's your next book? Oof, that's a tough one. Um, I never know until the publicity is done for the last one, but um, I was thinking on someone uh, doing something on like the narrative history of martial arts and do a kind of big sweeping book about where it started and the various tributaries and, and where it's going. So that's, that's probably too ambitious. I'll have to narrow that down, but that's what I've been toying around in my head right now. There's something I find fascinating and, and, by all means, if you take this and, and mm-hmm. run with it or, or if this becomes part of the narrative, I'll just smile and be happy that I was able to contribute. When we talk about the most pervasive, sarcastically implemented martial arts move, uh, movement in the United States, it is the judo chop. Why is it <laughs> judo? Why is it the judo chop? Why is it not a karate chop? There's something there. Yeah. And I don't know what it is. Do you want me Maybe to tell you? you? Find it. Yeah, do, if you know, please. Yes, I do. Oh, um, uh, so judo was the first art that was brought to America. Um, the, the Japanese came over, obviously, in the, in the teens, and were showing off their judo. And so anything martial arts related was judo. Mm. And karate didn't get uh, – karate didn't come over until – uh, American soldiers were stationed in Okinawa after World War II. And so anything up until about 1950 and in the movies, you will see a couple judo uh, moves done by white guys. Um, that's because judo came here first. And, and so it was the ubiquitous term for anything East Asian. And then karate became the ubiquitous term, and this drove all the Chinese guys crazy because they would say, Bruce Lee, he's a black belt in karate. <laughs> and he's like, we don't have belts. I don't do karate. <laughs> so it's just the effect of uh, Americans taking one term to mean essentially all of martial arts. Nice. Okay. Well, I've learned <laughs> something today, if nothing else. And, and listeners, if, if you ever doubted if the show was – scripted or anything there there's your proof because i don't <laughs> right. i don't generally embarrass myself live on the air with, with the guests <laughs> right. did i show up the host that you can edit this you out you did no no by all no no authenticity is key 
my ego is still intact, and I now have the answer. You know, education you is is key. All right, this this has been great having you on. I really appreciate it. If thank thank you, it was a lot of fun. I appreciate yeah. doing that. Yeah, let let's see. Normally on a conversation episode, I'm trying to flip this a little bit. Normally in a in an interview of you, I would say send us out with some kind of words of wisdom. But you're probably the best person to say if Bruce Lee was going to send the show out with some words of wisdom for the people listening. Yeah. What would it be? Uh, Bruce Lee's most important quote was adapt what is useful, reject what is useless, add what is specifically a your own. That was the essence of his philosophy, which was tradition is valuable, but you need to take what is good for you and at, make it your own because the individual is more important than the style. So that's what Bruce Lee would say. And then he'd finish by saying, be water, my friend. Hopefully after listening to that conversation, you can agree with me. There is probably no one that knows Bruce Lee better than Mr. Polly, at least not before you read this book. <laughs> if you want, you can head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find the link to Amazon where you can grab the book for yourself and you should at least check it out. It, it should be something on your radar, even if you're not going to buy it, because it does have an impact on you as a martial artist, because Bruce Lee has an impact on you as a martial artist. Again, our standard disclaimer, whenever someone is on the show and they have something to sell, we receive no funds, no kickback, no benefits other than I received a free copy of the book. And no, that's not why I do this, because let's be honest, I receive a lot of books. I don't read most of them. And the majority of authors never come on the show. But Mr. Polly struck me as a great guy and he wrote a great book. What more reason did I need than to say yes? I want to thank you for your time today. Thanks for tuning in. You can find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick. You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Check out everything we offer at whistlekick.com. It's a lot of whistle kicks, isn't it? <laughs> Bam. All right, here we go. I'm done. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.